chapter six talks about uh, is um, wiring methods. When you become an electrical designer, the first thing you need to do, Aaron, my friend, is decide what type of wiring method matches my application. I told you guys before, between EMT conduit and MC cable, you almost, between the conduit and the cable, you almost covered 90% of your wiring methods. EMT conduit and cables and MC cable. So this chapter talks about other applications for, for conduits and cables. So wiring method, chapter three. If you want to know why can't I use barbed wire, barbed wire as a wiring method, right? Why can't why can't I? Because it's not in chapter three. That's the the answer. Uh, granted, it's stupid too, but because it's not chapter three, right? Why can't I use a conduit, EMP conduit, as a carrying carrying conductor? Carry carrying conductor, the conduit itself to carry current. Can I? Does it work if you put two conduits, phase A and phase B, and you run a motor at two phases or two hots to a motor? It will. Is it efficient? No. Is it safe? Absolutely not. So that's where, where do you know that from the NEC code book? So chapter three, these are the few, a few things that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, number one, raceways. <clears throat> a couple of things about raceways and cables. So before I go ahead, if you guys like EMT, and MC cable between these two, you are good up to 90% of your wiring methods from the get go, right? Between the MC and EMT, if you are there, you are good up to 90% of your of your uh, of your system. Okay, identify installation requirement for raceways. Uh, installation requirement for raceways. Where can I use a raceway? Where can I use a cable? What are the requirements for using a cable and a raceway? We'll talk about this one in a second. Select the proper size raceway. I'm going to do uh, sizing raceways. Um, you guys did sizing raceways with Gary, right? Fuva. I'm going to do two examples about sizing raceways. Um, and we will uh, verify them with the calculator that we have. Not today, though, but we will do two examples about sizing raceways. How many conductors you can put in them. Metric designators. Uh, this is the IES. I mean, the, this is the international standard code related to the inches. Um, I'm not going to do a proper box sizes. Box sizes, guys, the only one I'm going to uh, highlight is the pull box. Pull box. Boxes. We went through the outlet boxes and box fill calculation last quarter. Uh, this book talks again about the box fill. Please read the chapter. Please do the, the homework. It's a good refresher, but I'm not going to go in details over box fill calculation, I think, because we did we did really good job in the in the last uh, time. The only thing I want to do though, I want to do the pull box. Um, the pull box is when you have a big fat box and you bring conduits into it, you pull your conductors through it from point A to point B. That's what we're going to do we, because they're sized differently. They're sized differently. Select the proper size of box depending on the entry raceway and orientation of the boxes, matching the box to the, um, to the raceway. We'll talk about this one. Um, Okay, so this is just a couple of things, guys. When you talk about boxes, we always we always have the metric designator for all the boxes as, as well as the conduit. Um, boxes and conduit has a metric designator. This table lists a couple of the metric designator. I don't know if you guys can see it right in here um, in, in your page. It will tell you the metric designator, for example. If you have a one inch is metric designator 27. And I think it's this is stands for 27 squared millimeters, squared millimeters, the cross-sectional area of that conduit in millimeter. Obviously, I can't think of anybody who call a one inch at 27 uh, metric millimeter here. So one inch is one inch, okay? But they give you the designator. They also give you the sizes, um, waste were permitted in sizes, um, limited to, okay, so they have different sizes, yes, no. Um, Metric designator. So the most important thing is really the metric designator in this particular one slide here. Moving into um, rigid metal conduit. Rigid metal conduit is the worst conduit that you're going to be encountering. The hardest to work with. The hardest to bend. Uh, it's threaded. Rigid metal conduit. It's threaded. You have it threaded. You can thread it if you want to. 
So why would I use uh, rigid male conduit? Unless you have a severe physical protection view for your conductors or hazardous classified location class one, class two, uh, you would not use rigid male conduit. Can I have thumbs up, Chad? So this is typically, where would you use a rigid? Typical, typical application. A service, bringing the service uh, to the building overhead, rigid. Uh, that's a typical overhead. Uh, I mean, or oh, above ground, not overhead, above ground. You're bringing above ground, rigid. Um, if hazardous location, rigid. If you are manufacturing, manufacturing uh, floors uh, because there are cranes moving all over, right? Lifting uh, cranes and all stuff. Anything that need, that you can run a car into the conduit to be rigid. Does that does that make sense, guys? Using rigid metal conduit. A couple of rigid. So physical, and I can't under, I can't emphasize the word maximum. Not just physical protection because every conduit provides physical protection. Almost every conduit, but the maximum physical protection for the conductors. It's a heavy, a heavy wall construction, thick. It's threaded, so you have threaded. Uh, uh, and if you thread them in the field, you have to protect them from corrosion resist. You have to put corrosion resistance compound in them to, to protect them. You can bend these. You can either bend them in the field or by the bending, uh, they can come from size half an inch all the way to size six inch. So big, big rigid mill. There's steel and aluminum. Steel comes to six inches. Um, brass, they come in a brass too. Um, the, the material that they make them, steel, aluminum, brass. And what else, Chad? Um, so they come in different different materials. Um, if highly corrosive environment, um, brass is a good application, the material that they make them, make them from. So where, where would I use a conduit like rigid mill conduit, Aaron, if you... If you ever hear about it, bringing the service above ground into the building, manufacturing floor, above ground wire conduits where trains are running from point A to point B, heavy industrial applications, rigid, heavy industrial, hazardous location, class one, class two, gas stations, um, chemical plants, um, service, as I said, above ground service. Um, that's, that's about it. Would you use rigid here in this room? Can I use rigid? Yes. Is it a good idea to use rigid? No. Any comments, guys, about rigid metal conduits? So that's the kind of the typical thing I want. Use is permitted. You can almost use it anywhere, above ground, below ground, um, in any location, any location. They have a couple of hand benders that you can bend rigid with, but there's also hydraulic and electrical benders. We bend them up to size... Um, Three quarter and one, I believe you can bend them by hand, the rigid. Uh, it's really hard to bend them though, up to size one. After size one, it becomes almost impossible for rigid to be bent. You, you need a hydraulic or electrical benders. You guys, did, you've seen them with us, but you didn't do the hydraulic benders. But be aware, why do I care, Kerry? Because when you do your takeoff for your project, right? You guys are estimators, aren't you? You're not just designers, you're gonna do it estimating. When you want to use rigid, be aware that it will take longer for the electricians to bend rigid than to bend EMT conduit. That's why the conduit of choice for any building is what? EMT. Cool. Unless you need rigid, you shouldn't use it. Any questions guys about this? Rigid? So um, uh, the types that we, we talked about, types they come, they have red brass, they are aluminum, um, they have galvanized steel or stainless steel. Red brass aluminum. Um, there's corrosive env in corrosive environment. If you guys look at page uh, 118, atmospheric condition and occupancies. So if you have galvanized environment, your uh, I mean corrosive environment, your conduit of choice would be galvanized steel, uh, stainless steel, and red brass rigid elbows and fittings. Uh, you can use others, you can use aluminum, except you have to supplement it for, uh, for what? For corrosion. So anyway, if you have a highly corrosive environment, uh, an example of this, guys, we used it in uh, wastewater treatment plants, right? Wastewater treatment plants. What they do is they take the rigid metal conduit um, and they have a PVC coated above it. Why would they have a PVC coated rigid metal conduit? Because they want the rigid protection of the conductors it's harsh environment. And number two, it's highly corrosive. So they want, if you put steel by itself, you wouldn't find it after a couple of years. It would be rusting, complete. 
So be very aware, a rigid milk conduit is a great conduit, but if it's highly corrosive environment, it's not a good conduit, um, at least not all of them. So you have to use highly corrosive environment, you need galvanized steel, stainless steel, or brass. And these are all three types of rigid metal conduit. You, can't, you don't use aluminum or steel by itself. Aluminum or steel would be used in an environment that needs protection, but it's not highly corrosive environment, if that makes sense. Okay, so that's your uh, original conduit. The second conduit is called IMC. IMC goes from half an inch all the way to four inches. Now remember, rigid milk conduit go to how many inches? Six inches. So that's superiority, right? Superior, bigger conduits. These are limited to four inches, IMC. They're steel conduits. Um, you can use them almost in every location that you can use rigid. The same application for rigid, you can use it for IMC. It's a, it's a hybrid between EMT and rigid. So somewhere, so EMT is smaller shell. Then rigid is thicker shell, and the one, somewhere in between is the IMC. IMC. Um, you can use threaded or non-threaded fittings with it. So your choice. You can thread it or non-thread it. The outside diameter, as you know, there in my friend, is the same for uh, IMC and rigid. So you can use the same fittings with them outside diameter. The inside diameter is different. So the inside diameter is different. The outside diameter is the same. So you can use the same fittings with rigid and IMC. <clears throat> any comments, any questions guys about IMC? Where would you use it? In the same location that you use um, rigid. The same location that you use rigid. So that's your IMC. IMC conduit. We talk about IMC conduits, steel conduits. Okay, so that's um, moving on and we're, we're, we're jumping, moving on into your conduit of choice. Can you please highlight this one and say this is your conduit of choice? These are non-threaded EMT conduit. So it's a uh, thin wall, race waste, uh, non-threaded. In our project, it's specified for the branch circuits and the feeders. And fittings uh, use non-threaded couplings and connectors. All we use non-threaded. You guys are looking at it right there in front of you. The conduit, the conduit of choice, unless you have severe physical protection, is going to be EMT. Minimum. Here's where you will use minimum EMT. You use minimum EMT in feeders. Feeders. If you have a feeder, minimum you have to use EMT, right? Uh, unless you have severe physical protection. Can I use EMT for branch circuits? Yes. What's the alternative for using EMT with branch circuits? Cables, MC cables. But for feeders, it becomes almost must when you bring feeders in a commercial building. At least you put it in an EMT conduit. Non-threaded couplings and connectors come with it. Compression type and non-compression type connectors that you use. Uh, no threaded at all. Any comments, any questions? Oh, sizes. Here's the drawback. The size that these come from is half an inch to four inches. Oops, four inches. So this is a draw. This is a drawback, right? Smaller sizes in conduit. Any comments? Any questions, guys, about the EMT? Can I have a thumbs up, Chad? We understand. If we go to a commercial building, and our my feeders will be at least if they're above ground, above ground EMT conduit. If they need <laughs> physical protection because they're above ground outside, we put them rigid. How about if your feeders are underground? What's your conduit of choice if they're underground? PVC, you got it. If they're underground, PVC. Above ground, what's your conduit of choice? It's going to be empty. Your conduit of choice is going to be empty. Okay, so that's uh, that's my EMT. Installation require use bend. Yeah, you can bend them. It's easy to bend them. Um, there's three kinds of bends, guys. We'll talk about this one: is stub ups and back to back, and um, three point several and four point several, and so forth. Uh, installation. Where do you install EMT conduit? I always say, if you go to the code, guys, can I bury an EMT conduit steel? Yes. Is it a good idea to bury a steel EMT conduit? No. If you put, here's really, conduits are very simple. If you're above ground, your conduit of choice is EMT. If you're below ground, your conduit of choice is what? PVC. That's as simple as this, right? If you're pulling feeders, you almost have to put them in a conduit. Almost have to put them in a conduit. Um, if you have a severe physical protection or hazardous location, your conduit of choice will be a rigid metal conduit. That's it. As simple as that in terms of conduit. Any comments, any questions? Any comments about the EMT? 
any questions? So that's a couple of things about the EMT. Um, can I use EMT in outdoor? Yes, they're rated to be used outdoor. We use compression fittings with them instead of set of screws when we use them outside. Uh, rain tight and drainage of raceways. So this is when this is just a couple of things. As you bring your raceways inside the building, they don't want you to make they don't to channel the water from the outside into the inside, dump it right above your switch gear. So you have some type of a drain type and drainage of the raceways. So you have to have a provide a path for the water to run into. You don't want to provide a path to run right into the top of your equipment. So you have to have, as you bring them in, you have to have an elbow where they can, the water can seep away from the electrical equipment. So that's that. what the inspectors, I know you guys are designers, but that's what the inspectors and the project managers will be looking for. All these elbows are these uh, drainage fittings that you have to put as you bring the conductors and conduits into the building. You put a conduit and there's water condensation coming in the conduit. What happens if that, not just if it's water tight, that's no problem. But what happens with condensation, create water, it's going to channel all this water and dump it right to the top of what? Your piece of equipment. And you and I understand fully that water and electricity don't mix. So you're going to have an arc flash inside your system, inside your building. Um, so you have, to, you have to provide a means of channeling the water away from the, the conduit. Raceway seal, we'll talk about raceway seal, guys. Um, if, if, long story short, if you bring a conduit between two different temperatures, you have to seal. You have to seal between, you, outside the inside, you seal. In 2011, Jeff, they came up with, you also have to seal if you're coming from underground into the building with a feeder or branch circuit or a service. Why? Because they got tired of all these creatures coming through the conduit into the switch gear and being electrocuted, making an arc flash. So you have to seal uh, if you're coming from underground, you, PVC conduit coming into the bottom of the switch gear. You have to seal as you enter the switch gear. Can I have thumbs up about sealing? Do it as you seal. Seal from environment outside to inside because of the temperature, and seal from underground into the switch gear underground because we don't want the creature to, to see to get into the conduit and and into the um, switch gear, snakes and so forth, and create an arc flash, right? A hazard, arc flash hazard. So that's where you sealed. Um, of course, there's another seal in hazardous location. We'll talk about this one, then there's a chapter. You seal also in hazardous location gas station because you don't want the conduit to channel the gas um, in from point A to point B in your system. That's, we'll talk about the hazardous location seal as we, we need it. Um, if you put a sealant, the seal that you seal with, with, the last thing you want to do is this. As you seal, a seal is just a compound you put, you put your conductor and you put that compound uh, to cover around the conductor, right? So nothing can get in, including water. Now you, do, you want this compound that it has chemicals in it. Do you want this compound to eat into the insulation of your conductor? Is that a good idea? No. So long story short, they always say the sealant has to be identified for the insulation and the shield, if any. Um, duct seal is a common compound that they use. It has to be identified for the insulation. So if you put it, it's not going to eat into, it's chemicals, eat into your insulation, right? So great, you seal from water, but you actually damage your insulation, so you're going to have an arc flash or short circuit. Okay, so that's your sealing. Any comments, guys, about the conduit? Summarize. Summarize. If you go overhead in a building, your conduit of choice is what? Can I have EMT, right? EMT, at least four feeders for branch circuit and carriage, but at least four feeders. Okay, coming from underground, your conduit of choice is what? PVC. Rigid, where would I use rigid or animated? The two rigid and animated, where would I use them? Severe physical protection. Examples, gas station, hazardous location, explosion proof, hazardous location area, heavy industrial plants, Everywhere, you know, we, we, if you guys go, I, yesterday I was at Gerdu, uh, yeah, that was yesterday, and every, they do not use any conduit, they, their business is uh, melting steel and making rebars. They don't use any conduit anywhere in the whole compound other than rigid. Rigid is their conduit of choice for everything that they do. Everything is rigid, brand circuit service, you name it. But what's their business as? They melt steel. So you can imagine the cranes running around, heavy industrial, always rigid. Can I have thumbs up, Chad? Cool? Okay. Now, there are two types of conduit, guys. 
there is actually conduits are divided into two two categories. Category now is flexible conduits, or flexible non flexible. Everything that we talked about, uh, Jeff, is non flexible. EMP, rigid, PVC, and so forth, non flexible. The flexible conduit, the flexible conduit, they have three types. Uh, flexible metallic conduit, liquid type, flexible metallic conduit, and liquid type, flexible non-metallic conduit. Uh, it doesn't take a genius to see the word liquid and understand when we use a liquid type. Anybody can guess if it has the word liquid in it, where would you use it? In a wet location, right? That's it. The only difference between the liquid, liquid type, and liquid both of them, any, anyone that has liquid, you use it in a wet location, indoor or outdoor. Cool. If it doesn't have a liquid, like flexible metallic conduit, you cannot use it in a wet location. Done. Now, the question for Aaron, my friend, is what the heck is this conduit? These flexible metallic conduit. Okay, let's talk about not where you use it first. What is the ideal application to use this network? Ideally, not what the code says, ideally. Ideally, these conduits are meant to tie to equipment. Can I have a thumbs up, Chad? So flexible metallic conduit, you tie to the fixture with it. Equipment like a fixture, air handling unit, uh, rooftop unit, you tie to it. So um, um, pumps, you tie to it. Why don't you think you want to bring EMT directly into an air handling unit? Vibration, vibration. So, so why do we use flexible metallic conduit to tie to equipment? Ease of installation and absorption of vibration from these equipment. Can I have a thumbs up, Chad? So that's it. That's the ideal application for these conduits. What's the difference between the two? If it has liquid type, you use it in a wet location. If it doesn't have a liquid type, you use it in a dry location. That's all. Really a difference. Now, what's the difference between the two? Liquid type flexible metallic conduit and liquid type non-flexible metallic conduit. Anything, let me tell you the other division. If you guys understand chapter three, really easy. Anything that has um, non-metallic is ideal for highly corrosive environment. So what happens if you have a highly corrosive environment, Jeff, a highly corrosive environment, and a machine in a highly corrosive environment, and I want to tie to that machine. Liquid type, flexible, non-metallic conduit becomes ideal. Anything non-metallic is ideal for highly corrosive environment. Highly corrosive environment typically is what? Underground, chemicals eating into the steel and the metallic, uh, or in chemical plants. There's a pl places where we have chemicals, vapor coming out of chemicals and eat into the steel um, that you're doing it. So anyway, so these two, we use them in wet location. The bottom one is used in highly corrosive environment. If you have a highly corrosive environment, that will be your conduit of choice. Can I have a, a thumbs up, Chad? That's it. That's really the, the application. So you have an air handling unit right here. Here's my air handling unit. What you do is you bring your disconnect over here. You bring your EMT conduit here, typically EMT. Here's your disconnect, and from here, you flex it. You flex it. See how they typically do it? They bring the flex, they flex it into the conduit, the air handling unit. Any comments? And this is if this is outside, most likely it's going to be outside wood location. So what do we use? We use liquid type flexible metallic conduit. Done. Like your air conditioning, guys, you've seen it all the time. The outside unit of the air conditioning. What do you do? Flexible liquid type flexible metallic conduit. Very important thing is if you're in this situation, one little thing you have to pull an equivalent ground conductor. Here's my ground. So I pull inside this or outside an equivalent ground conductor. Can you guys add this one? So inside the flex, you have to pull an equivalent ground conductor as you tie to, to the equipment. Uh, there is exception for doing that, like for lighting fixture, 20 amp, uh, the exception. But the rule for equipment, guys, mechanical equipment, always pull an equivalent ground conductor. Can I have thumbs up, Chad? That's it. That's your flexible. Where do we use them to tie to equipment? Fixtures or mechanical equipment? Lighting fixtures or mechanical equipment? So that's your flex to get your flexibility. So these are your conduit of choice. Uh, a couple of things about um, a flexible metallic conduit. A flexible metallic conduit guys look like MC cable, MC cable without conductors inside it, right? You guys have seen them with us here, MC cable without conductors in it. You put conductors in it, but in fact, you put a conductor in it, it becomes MC cable, really. Um, so wrapped around flexible metallic uh, conduit is commonly used to connect recessed lighting fixtures Recess fixture is another application that's flexible metallic conduit or non-metallic conduit. 
equipment or fixtures, including that one. Here's a good example. You can see these are all equipment, and we're using flexible or liquid tie or flexible to tie to these equipment. Can I have a thumbs up, Chad? Hopefully, I understand that one. Can I wire Dunwoody with a flexible metallic conduit by code? Yes. Is it a good idea? No. Do you guys see that? Can I wire it? Yes. Is it a good idea? No. It's foolish. Okay, so where did my... So that's your flexibility. Uh, liquid tight has... So liquid tight, as I said, has a jacket. What they do is they have a jacket at the top to protect the... Um, to, to protect um, to protect from water. So non-metallic, liquid type flexible non-metallic conduit. Liquid type flexible non-metallic conduit guys have three types, different types that we use for different application, A, B, C, um, and these have their own fittings, A, B, C, so you gotta be careful if you're using liquid type, non-flexible metallic conduit. Uh, the same thing, liquid type flexible metallic conduit have its own fittings. If you're an electrician, if you're a takeoff, you're going to be take, doing takeoff. You have to be aware that these have expensive, you go liquid type flexible metallic conduit. And the fittings and the cable is more expensive and the wearing methods, right? The cheap, that's why people use the cheapest. What's the cheapest? To tie to equipment. Flexible metallic conduit. Just to tie to equipment. Flexible metallic conduit. So if I am to tie a piece of equipment the cheapest way, say if I have a, a pump right there, right? I have a pump and I want to tie it the cheapest way. I want to wire it the cheapest way, big pump. I will take EMT conduit with conductors inside it to a disconnect right next to the pump. From there, I flex it with the right flex, and that will be the cheapest way with flexible metallic conduit, the cheapest way of wiring that board. Any comments, any questions, guys, about that? So that's um, that's your uh, flexible liquid tight. Okay, smoother, seamless inner core. So they have different designs. You guys will read through the designs uh, listed for use with various LFC. They have different fittings that you can use for different applications here. Um, okay, here you go. So as you can see, it, there are three types of it, A, B, and C used for different applications. You guys will refer to the code for into details. We don't want to spend too much time on that. Rarely used, as I said, between the flexible and liquid tight flexible guys you cover almost any type of equipment that we use in the commercial building um mc and ac cable mc cable if you're an engineer you're going to be looking at an mc cable the difference the mc cable guys have a grounding conductor an insulated grounding conductor that's the difference they look alike except the mc cable is more robust better wiring method that has an, an equipment ground conductor in it um so keep this in mind uh, PVC conduit. So when let me. So we talked about guys EMP conduit. When would it be a good idea to use cables instead of conduits? A good example is I will take an EMP conduit three quarter of an inch right here into a J box. From the J box, I can use an MC cable to feed all these lights. Here's a good application with MC cable. I can also wire everything in this building with MC cables. Everything. If you have um, if you have studs. And, and, and sheet rock wall, studs and sheet rock wall in a commercial building. Studs and sheet wall, rock wall design, commercial building. That's a good application instead. Can I use EMT in it? Yep. Uh, the cheapest and the easiest way studs and sheet rock wall in a commercial building is what? MC cable. You put your MC cable, branch circuit, and go from receptacle to receptacle, feed your six receptacles, and feed your 18 lights in the, in the ceiling. Can I have thumbs up, Chad? What's the drawback if you use a cable versus an EMT? If you use a cable, you're stuck with what you use. If you use an EMT conduit, you can add conductors if you allow for future expansion. That's the nice thing about using EMT conduit versus MC cable. Okay, PVC. PVC, guys, we talked about PVC. PVC is your conduit of choice if you're going underground, in concrete or direct barrier. So you, this is your conduit of choice. There are two types, as you guys know. There's the 40 and there's the 80. The only difference between them, if you're going underground, you use the 40 because there's no physical damage. If you are coming from underground, you're emerging from underground, above ground, and to go into the building, you, you have to have um, a PVC Schedule 80 because it provides physical damage, physical uh, protection for physical damage. Not severe physical damage, though. Not like the rigid metal conduit or the uh, IMC, 
but it will provide, it's approved to provide a good physical damage for your, your, con for your con conductor. Um, again, we use proven cement with them as we tie together when you guys are not electrician, but when you install them, be aware of that one. So you have to, as you install these, you have to put some type of cement in them for the connectors. They come with, uh, uh, every one of these conduit methods, guys, come with a set of couplings, connectors, and boxes, right? I can't use, for the most part, I can't use a PVC couplings. I can't use a PVC couplings or connectors on an EMT conduit or an EMT condu conduit uh, connectors on a rigid or, uh, or, an, uh, or a flexible metallic conduit. They all have their own different connectors to connect to the equipment and couplings to tie them together. Can I have thumbs up, Chad? And chapter six, when you guys read it, there's a lot of stuff that you can, uh, a lot of pictures of these. Okay, so PVC, we talked about complete fittings and boxes that comes with it, adapters and so forth. Um, ENT, ear, nose, and throat. Ear, nose, and throat. Anybody have used that conduit? Ear, nose, and throat. This is equivalent to the EMT except in a very highly corrosive environment. If you have a highly corrosive environment, remember, highly corrosive environment, you put steel, you put metallic, what's going to happen to it? Frost. So if you have a highly corrosive environment, above ground, highly corrosive environment, your conduit of choice becomes what? ENT. Can I have thumbs up, Chad? So it's right next to it, equivalent to the EMT, except in a highly corrosive environment. Um, so pliable, anybody, did you work with them? Uh, Darren, ENT. Uh, flexible ENT, they used, uh, I believe, ENT used a lot in um, barns, um, uh, chicken barns and all this stuff. Imagine the chemicals that they use there. Uh, high, very highly corrosive environment. You use EMT, uh, you're done. Another option instead of this one is e PVC too. It's like PVC, exactly the same. Except it's nicer, easier to work with. It's pliable. You can bend it by hand versus uh, PVC. You have to have a, a heater. When you bend them, you have to heat it. These you can bend it by hand. So these are really cool hand bending. So highly corrosive environment. Uh, Use it for rich with spread size one and smaller. Look at the drawback though. See the drawback of size two or smaller? You can encase in concrete too, another application for it, encase in concrete, um, but handheld, pliable. There's different type of connecting them together. There's one piece, snap on and clamp shells the way, or you can have uh, some of them go with solvent, cement, uh, fittings uh, for PVC, um, works with them. So it has to have its own boxes and accessories. Um, so, every one of these conduits, for the most part, guys, comes with its own connectors and own couplings. Can I have thumbs up? Every one of them. Okay. Okay, now this is the different types. Summarize. Rigid for service, above ground, rigid mill conduit, hazardous location, and industrial plants. That's where you use rigid or intermediate. EMT, everywhere, everywhere else, indoor, in for the most part, everywhere else indoor, at least for feeders. PVC, underground, right? A flexible, liquid tight, outside tight equipment, non liquid tight, flexible metallic conduit. Um, if it's not liquid tight, where do you do it? Indoor. What else? ENT is highly corrosive environment indoor. So that summarizes the whole conduit system and support. Typically, the conduits, guys, we support them every six feet, the rigid conduit um, and EMT. We support them every three feet from every box, three feet, and 10 feet in between, for the most part. They have different supports, depending on the size and so forth. Okay, raceway sizes. I'm not going to, I'm going to just go over this because I'm going to do an example. Raceway sizes depends on how many conductors you put in a raceway, the cross section of the raceway, and the installation. Cross section area insulation too. The insulation of the raceway. Um, so that's, we will do an example, guys. We'll take a bunch of conductors and we size a, a raceway for it. So, three things when we size um, raceways you have the size of the conductor and the insulation, the size and the insulation, and the type of the condu uh, conduit that you need EMT, PVC, flexible. Based on this, you can use the calculator to do that for you, or you can do it by, your, uh, by hand. Wireways and gutters. Wireways and gutters. Um, anybody knows in chapter three, guys, how many wiring methods you have? In chapter three, there's close to 
40 to 50 wiring methods in chapter three. You are lucky if you use 10 of them in your life career. You're lucky if you use 10 out of that 40. Another another uh, common wire ways are raceways. Raceways, we're looking at it right there. There's metallic and non-metallic raceways. Um, we use them, we size them differently. It's not the topic, we're not gonna talk about them. Good application spool, like you can see, they can be metallic, non-metallic, surface mounted raceways, met metallic and non-metallic. <laughs> uh, gutters, uh, wireways are, they look like the raceways, surface mounted raceways, but they're, they're limited in the size. Uh, gutters is, uh, we'll talk about gutters more. If you have a panel and you want to expand the panel for bending conduits, they add a little piece to that. So if you have a panel right here, and I want to design another big box next to it, that becomes a gutter because I want to bend the conductors right to this box. That's a gutter. Um, that's a good application for it. I need a bending space and I need to expand it. Um, we have wireways. Wireways, you pull them all the way here and you pull conductors for them. Um, I think they're limited to 30 feet, though. Wireways are limited to 30 feet. Raceways, surface mounted, no limit. So that's it. Well, most of the time, guys, we're not going to be using them. Schools are good, notorious, the famous for raceways. Okay, here's um, a couple of things um, I'm going to highlight. So um, if you look at the installation THHN, this is, guys, uh, this is chapter four, the NDC code book, chapter five. I'm sorry, chapter five. So uh, this is for you, Aaron, my friend. If you look at the insulation, first, the insulation THW and a conductor number, let's say number six conductor, okay? The cross-sectional area for number six conductor is this value. Cool? Any question, guys, how to find the cross-sectional area of any conductor based on the size and insulation? If I have 10 of these, if I have 10 of these, I multiply by 10, and that will get me 0.7. Two six square inch. Did they do the math right? Did they do a math right? If I have 10 of them. Now suppose I have another THHN conductor, <coughs> number four, and I also have um, I also have 10 of these. The multiply by 10, that will get me 0.824 uh, cubic inch. Uh, square inch. Square inch. Any comments, guys? Any questions about that? So you multiply them by their number, and then add them up. Can somebody add these up, please, for me? 0 0.72, 0 0.726, and 0.824. Anybody? 1.544. Square inch. See how easy that is? You multiply by how many of them you have, add them up, right? And, and then you have a conduit like this. Here's my conduit. And I'm going to put these 10 condu 20 conductors here, all of them on one conduit. There's a 20 of them. Different insulation, different sizes. Any comments, guys? Any questions, Andrew, my friend? Any comments, any questions about this? Now, when you take this one from Chapter 5, then you're going to go to uh, table, chapter, chapter 9, table nine. 5. Chapter 9, Table 5, when you take this value, you can size the conduit like we're going to do in a second. Any comments, any questions about sizing this? Aaron, make sense? Okay, remember the 1.544, okay? So remember that one, 1. 1.544. Um, okay, conductor raceways. All the conductors of the same circuit, guys, must be installed in the same raceways because of what? Inductive heat, we know that. All the conductors of the same circuit must be installed in the same raceway because it reduces the voltage drop. Voltage drop will be reduced as well as voltage drop reduction and as well as, well as inductive heat, as well as inductive heat. Um, so what happens if you put all the conductors in the same uh, raceway, guys, the magnetic field will cancel. Can I get you to understand any type of conduit? You have a circuit of phase A, B, C, and a neutral, and a ground. Where do you put them? inside the same conduit. So we know that. Special conservation, determine the length. Electrician must determine the length. So when you do with conduits, guys, you need to have the length of the conduit, the number of conductors in the raceway, the rating factors, because remember, the ambicity, if you put more than three, you have to do it. Uh, make allowances for voltage drop. You might have to go higher because of voltage drop. Um, 
Recognize correct receptacle types at the end of these raceways. We'll move into the second one. Especially consideration, um, insulating, grounding, and bonding bushings. At the end of the conduits, guys, you have to have two types of, uh, for the most part, you have to have type, two types of bushings. One bushing and insulation bushings. Here's your conductor coming in. You have to have some type of an insulation bushing, so protect the insulation as it enters the box. Okay? For all rigid, anything, uh, all conduit, if you put conductor number four or larger, I believe, going out of memory, four or larger, and for any size, if it's rigid threaded. You have to put an insulation bushing to protect the conductor. Now, bonding bushings. Bonding bushing used if you have uh, in a lot of application right at the surface. We'll talk about this one, guys, when we do the grounding. Right at the surface, and also if you're encountering, if the hole doesn't match the conduit. So just keep this in mind. There's, uh, there's something called uh, reducing washers. If you have an inch hole and a three-quarter of an inch conduit, what do you do to make the inch hole fit the three-quarter of an inch? You have a reducer, a washer reducer. If you use a washer reducer, guys, what do you need to do? They need to bond. Then you bond the conduit. You have a bonding bushings, especially at the surface and the feeders. So that's my um, my conduits. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about the box types, guys. We talked about boxes and sizing boxes a lot last time, uh, device boxes. Box style and sizes, securing boxes um, to the walls, masonry boxes that you can use, handy boxes. So this talks about the actual boxes that you use to land the conduits in. Um, square boxes are very common, but you have to have a, a, a fitting on the square boxes. Um, there's the handy boxes that immediately you tie the devices to it. So different type of boxes that you can assign with these conduits. 4x4 four four is notoriously famous. You can use them as a junction box or as a device box. But remember, you need to have an extension cover. Uh, if you want it a J box, it will be a different cover than it would be a device box. Octagonal boxes. So this talks about all the types of boxes with pictures that you're going to be looking at that you can use. Octagonal boxes used for devices and fixtures and so forth. Um, and then moving through these. There is also oversized square boxes to give you more room for extension for uh, devices as well as uh, with raised plaster cover for devices as well as for gear boxes. And then there's a few calculation guys about the box fill and I'm not going to go through the box fill because we did it last quarter. Um, unused opening in all the boxes you have to, what do you do with unused opening in any box? You have to close it because you don't want bugs and dirt and everything else you have to close it shall be listed. Um, uh, boxes filled with conductors, the same. We talked about the box fill, guys, so I'm not going to talk about the box fill calculation. We have a few examples of box fill calculation. Um, this is a couple of examples. You guys, please read them and do the box fill in, in the code. Another thing that you have to pay, pay attention, guys, I, I say watch out here, watch out. Um, if you put a dimmer, as we know, uh, Jeff, my friend, you put a dimmer in a box, dimmers are big, fat, fluffy. You might, you have to pay attention also to the width and the depth. So long story short in a commercial building, guys, the idea is always go for deeper boxes. Deeper boxes can give you a lot of room for future expansion. Don't go very shallow boxes, even if it meets the code. So it allows you to change the devices into dimmers, for example, and so forth. Okay, so that's... Um, Pull boxes, I promise I'm going to work, do calculation about the pull boxes. The only time you use a pull box, guys, is if you have, if you want to pull um, a feeder, Jeff, um, 100 feet or 200 feet. It's hard to pull a feeder 500, four of them, guys, 100 feet or 200 feet between two buildings. It's hard to, sometimes we put, if the distance is long, I would say 200 feet, 400 feet. I will put a pull box right in between them so I can pull my conductors, number one. Number two. If I have more than 360 degree bend in the conduits, you have to have a pull box. <coughs> what constitutes a pull box? If you bring one conductor at least, number four larger, one conductor, number four larger, the J box right here above the ceiling becomes a pull box. Can I have a thumbs up, Chad? One conductor at least in any box, you bring it in any box. Uh, if you bring that uh, conductor into the box, that box change from a uh, junction box, device box, into a pull box. And we'll do some calculation for that one. We'll do some calculation. 
So that's that's about it, guys, in terms of uh, of this. Any comments, any questions, any comments, any questions about this chapter? I can't emphasize what I emphasize, guys, the EMT, use the EMT, use of the PVC, and the MCK. These are really the most important things about it. I want to flash a couple of uh, things, guys. I have a couple of pictures here. Um, there is a term that running threads, they don't want you to use them. Anybody in the electrician, why don't you use running threads? You need tight connection. Running threads doesn't give you tight. It keeps going. It keeps going. So there's a term running threads. You don't want to use them with, with rigid. Here's a couple of, uh, um, not like you guys are going to be bending conduits, but these are hand bent conduits. Um, I don't go over that one. Here's the seal. This is interesting. As you enter, uh, Jeff, my friend, and Aaron, you have to seal at one end or both ends. Do you guys see that yellow thing here, the yellow fitting here? This is insulation bushings to protect the conductors from being damaged. And also you have to put seal because the creatures, you don't want snakes to sneak right in here all the way into your switch gear. That's code requirement for feeders, branch circuits, and services. Okay, when you put, this is what we say tying to equipment. You can put your flex, as we talked about these. Um, here's tying to equipment. I can't emphasize, I want you to look guys at the green conductor that you have to pull inside the flexible metallic conduit, always, because if you have flexibility, then the flex is not, the flexible metallic conduit is not qualified as an equipment garden conductor. Some exceptions, six feet or less, 20 amp, for fixtures, typically mostly for fixtures, but for equipment, you pull an equipment garden conductor. Okay, so another thing is, if you have a PVC conduit, it's very, very important. They want you to have an expansion fittings for PVC conduits because uh, non-metallic, if you put it outdoor from 100 for, for 100, uh, so 100 degrees in Minnesota all the way to 25 below, the conduit is going to expand and expansion contact. So they want you to have the size a fitting like this that allows the conduit to breathe. Only PVCs for the most part. <coughs> Okay, here's where we use um, electrical non-metallic conduits application, highly corrosive environment, like we said. A couple of things, guys, about EMT I want to highlight. Um, look at the support system, not like you guys an electrician. Flexible metallic conduit, you have to support them every one feet from the box. Can you guys see where you write to the box? Uh, flexible metallic conduit and EMT every four and a half feet. Uh, a foot and four and a half feet. If it's EMT, every three feet from the box, every 10 feet in between. So anyway, this will give you guys an idea. How do you support these conductors? Who cares? If you're if you're a designer, you will never care. If you're a project manager in the field, before the inspector walks in and says, this, see the EMT conduit, have to be supported within three feet from that box. And if it's not supported within three feet, of course, going to flag it. You will be the inspector before before the inspector walks out, okay? So please review these, there's a lot of numbers here, but for the most part, if it's cable, guys, a foot from the box, if it's a cable, if it's a conduit, three feet from the box, if it's the cable four and a half in between, for the most part, between the, uh, the support, if it's a conduit, 10 in between, most for the most part. There's some exceptions and, and, and rules and so forth. Talked about putting all the conductors, um, reducing bushings and so forth. Um, here's where you can reduce. I don't know if you guys see that reducer here that reduces a big hole into um, to match a smaller conduit. And the rest of them, guys, is device boxes and uh, different type of handy boxes um, that you can use with different fittings to put your equipment in. And I trust that here's a couple of examples, guys, what counts and what not counts in the, in box field calculation. I know we, we did a lot of work on that one. The last thing I want to say is, do you see that pull box? <coughs> this is a pull box, not today. But I would like to take uh, two examples on a pull box, do pull box calculation. It becomes, this becomes a pull box only the minute that you bring conductor number four or larger. You bring conductor number four or larger into this box, it moves from a J box into a pull box. And then there's certain calculation that you have to do, size that box. And this will talk guys about sizing the box and so forth. We'll, we'll do examples for it. Um, different type of fittings that you can use, compression fitting, different type of uh, uh, stop ups and back to back and angle that you do for bending. Um, so all these guys are different liquid type flexible metallic conduit application like we talked about this. 
cables, MC cable, AC cable versus MC cable, different type of MC cable. Here's an MC cable, for example. Can you guys see that green conductor here? That's a, a, a signature of an MC cable, better cable. Different type of installations that, that you can come up with, fittings to support. So I'm just going to flash all these for you, and you guys will look at them at your own convenience. On your convenience. There's a couple of comparing guys between MC and AC cable. I'm going to tell you, if you're, if you're working in an engineering firm, MC cable, period. It, it comes in a bigger conductor sizes, more number of conductors. MC have more conductors in the cable, bigger sizes, uh, and fully insulated grounding conductor. These are superior to the MC cable, to the AC cable. Can that thumbs up? Otherwise, insulation wise, you can install them almost in the same location. Um, so that's where it talks about the bins and the colors and so forth. You guys will do that. A couple of comparing between them. Um, I can't emphasize MC cable superior because it comes bigger sizes than other cables. We'll talk about a couple of calculation guys for the conduit, fill a number of conductors. Okay. Okay, that's that's about it. That's all I want to go. Any comments, any questions? I have two things I want to go over in this chapter, guys. Number one is pole box calculation. And number two, I want to do two examples of box filter, not box, conduit fill. Please read this chapter, guys. This is a summary of a whole chapter in any secret book. There's so much details um, that you can fill in as you go. So a liquid tight flexible metallic conduit, you can use it. We talked about the main application for it. There's exception here and there. But for the most part, we're engineers, guys. We use the best, best uh, uh, material for the job, right? The best material for the job. Any comments, any questions? What's the Cinderfell? Cinderfell is right here between the, the walls, if it's uh, like these, filling between the core fill. Is that what's so? Yeah, it's like a drop in the block. A drop in, right into that block. Yeah. Yeah, right here, these blocks, right through that blocks. Typically, if it's outside, it's going to be wet location. If it's inside, it's going to be dry location. Good point. Any comments, any questions? Good one. Any comments, any questions? I can't emphasize, guys, chapter three, you're going to live with it. I mean, the most important things we highlighted from EMP conduit. If you don't know where we use EMP conduit, you should ask your friend chat for refund. PVC conduit, rigid. Where we use it, the typical application. Exceptions, all this stuff, don't worry. There's so many exceptions. But the typical application for them and the MC cable. And, of course, the flex. These are the, these are the best out of this, uh, this chapter. Any comments, any questions? Okay, let's have five minutes, and I believe uh, Jeff Crowder is going to be here soon to go over some lighting.